I'm here today with Dr. Ben McFarlane. He is a uh, molecular biochemist uh, at Seattle Pacific University, a professor there, and a longtime member of our church, Bethany Community Church. And also, he's a husband, a father, a follower of Christ. Um, Dr. McFarland, I'm really grateful you're here with us. There's so much out there right now that we're hearing about the COVID-19 coronavirus, and you've been tracking this actually for a little while, so we want to make sure we had you on to kind of speak to this specifically with your area of scientific expertise. So my first question would really be, pretty generally speaking, uh, with all the unknown, what do we actually know, and what in your expertise have you found specifically about COVID-19? Right. Well, you've got to start with that, that we don't know a lot, and we even don't know what we don't know about this. But right now, there are some things that we do know. We know the chemical makeup of the virus, and we know what it is on the outside. On the outside, it's a bubble of oil, and so that means that you can wash it off with soap. On the inside, it's got an RNA genome, and the good thing about that genome is it's actually almost like a word in chemistry letters, okay? It's, they've got four letters in the RNA genome, and you can use them to spell out genes, and those genes are what make the virus work. Everything about this coronavirus makes sense to us at that level. We can read the genome, mm. and we can tell where it's been, in a sense, yeah. because we know how it mutates, and we can see how much it mutates. Got it. And specifically, how is this different than other coronaviruses? It's not different in the terms of the number of genes, or um, there are slight differences at the level of the letters that we can read. Where it's really different is that it's just a little bit worse to a lot worse in all of the important ways that a virus can be, sort of on the spectrum of viruses. You have the contagion, you have the mortality, you have the extent of hospitalization. All of those are a little bit worse than the regular kind of coronaviruses that we have. Mm -hmm. And these coronaviruses have been a problem for a while. Right. You remember SARS, there's another one called MERS. Um, because of that, we know they've been a problem for a while, and we do have some science that looks into how they work. So this looks like just a bad virus. It's definitely worse than what we're used to. And I would say, I would estimate it's about 10 times worse than sort of the seasonal flu that we're dealing with. Mm. That 10 times number multiplies out to a lot of different effects on our healthcare system, and it makes it a heavy burden for the healthcare providers to bear. Right, and you bring up the healthcare workers. So for those watching, we're actually here in Seattle, Washington, King County, which, uh, as many of you know, uh, really had been the epicenter in the United States, and one of the worst, uh, it was hit one of the worst spots here in the US. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about what hospitals are dealing with at this point. Mm -hmm. I know that we, as I read this morning, had hit up to 50 deaths in the state of Washington, most of which here in King County. Right. What are some things we can do uh, in addition to, you know, prayer and things like that, but those that are feeling symptomatic, you know, how is it impacting the hospitals and the health, uh, health workers at this point here in King County? Yeah, all the healthcare professionals are gearing up or already geared up for something like they've never really seen. Mm. Uh, the extent of hospitalization for this virus is probably the worst thing about it. It takes weeks in the hospital to get out of the hospital again for some of the cases. That means weeks on a ventilator, possibly. That means weeks under the care, um, weeks taking up a bed. Mm. And our system is just not set up for the possible influx of cases that we're going to get from this. And so I think one of the most important things is part of our society is sort of told to stay home and to stay away from each other, Yeah, which seems kind of weird. It's like, why don't I help people? Well, we have people who are trained to help. We have mm. buildings that are trained to help this exact thing, but they need the space and they need the energy to work. And I know a lot of healthcare providers at different levels throughout Seattle. They're already working, at, you know, they're working to the extent of their capabilities. And right. so, you know, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a question of how can you support them? How can you care for the people that you know that might have gotten a symptom and might not know if they have the virus or not? Mm. How can you buy groceries for your neighbor? It's the little things 
that will really be um, what most of us are called to. And then some of us are going to be called to, honestly, warlike conditions in some ways. Mm -hmm. We don't really know. It's one of the unknowns of just how bad will this be. But right now it's looking pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're already speaking into it, but really my, my final question is as followers of Christ, as the church, um, what are some specific ways we can do that, knowing that a lot of what we do is in community? I mean, is in physical community where we're not having to be six feet apart right now, you know? But, yeah. And then in Seattle, like a lot of other parts of uh, our nation is limiting, um, closing restaurants, closing bars, limiting gatherings where the recommendation of 10 or less. Right. So what can we be doing? Yeah. Uh, when I look at that, I mean, my family is the size of six. Yeah. So that 10 or less is getting pretty close to where we are. I'm sure there's going to be an exception like that. But um, you really do look at that and you say, is this really necessary? Definitely right now it is necessary is the thing that I've seen looking at the data. I sort of have a couple of videos that I put up on YouTube that sort of explain yeah. the reasoning behind this, why it's from the data. And it's not just me listening to somebody else telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about data is you can actually look at it and you can say, okay, what does this data say? Uh, and so what, one of the things I want to do is I want to look at the data. I've been trained as a scientist to be able to look at it and say, what does this mean? What does this say for the church? Um, looking at the data about the virus itself, like I said, it's about 10 times worse than a bad virus that we've already seen. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem with that is not just multiplying everything by 10, but what happens if systems get overwhelmed? Right. Then you have an extra multiplier on top of everything else. So avoiding that in any way possible calls for um, certain kinds of sacrifices, certain kinds of cutting back. The really amazing thing to me in some ways is that this is coinciding perfectly with the season of Lent. I've seen some people say, mm -hmm. you know, God, I told you what I was going to give up for Lent, but now you're taking all this other stuff away from me. There's a sense in which I think God is speaking to us as this is something that he wants us to step back a little bit, partially Sabbath. There's the part where you rest and you let God take care of things. Yeah. You connect with your family. You cancel business trips. Um, you play board games even. Right. You refrain from working. But I think even beyond that, I've seen the Sabbath idea going around a little bit. So that it's Lenten time. It's Sabbath. It's also seemingly like Jubilee. And the reason I say that is, if you look in Leviticus, the rules for Jubilee are every 49 years, and honestly, it's been about 100 years since we've had a flu like this in the U.S. Wow. Um, and every 49 years, a Sabbath of Sabbaths of years, you're supposed to take the entire year off. You're supposed to forgive debts. You're supposed to invite the poor into your home. Mm. You're supposed to do all these things that seem awfully appropriate right now. I don't know exactly what that looks like in terms of policy, yeah. but I can hear God speaking, saying, okay, you step back once a day every week. Maybe we should step back once every 49 years and listen to God's voice mm. for what should we give up? How should we help each other? And there's some people that are called to serve extra in this time. How can we support them? And how can we, um, as a scientist, the other thing I can see, how can I use my science to communicate what the best way to hold our bodies in this time is. You know, science yeah. deals with the body, right? Um, so how should we manage our bodies at this time? And uh, possibly even by God's grace, we could use science to find an antiviral drug or things like that. Mm. I'm out there, I'm looking for it. Um, a few glimmering hopes right now, but it's very early in the whole process. And so probably what we have is we have a time for patience, mm. a time for prayer, and um, I just keep thinking of the verse, this doesn't go out except by much prayer and fasting. Mm. It seems like this is a bigger thing than what we've dealt with before. But God has been with his people through Israel, through exile, when the land rested, yeah. through um, the church and all the plagues, that the Black Plague and all the other things that we've seen that have come before, the 1918 plague. Mm -hmm. uh, God has been faithful to his people through these times before. And it's very scary to live through it yeah. at the moment. But it also is something that will reveal um, God's faithfulness in the long run. Yeah. If we trust him 
to um, to the very end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good word. Well, thank you so much. Before we go, there are ways. Uh, Dr. Ben has been putting out a lot of this research, which has been really great. I know it's blessed me. That's why I wanted to get him here. Uh, how can people connect uh, with you? Right. I've got a channel on YouTube. It's Ben McFarland. And my Twitter handle is Ben J. McFarland. Okay. I think I remember that right. And uh, I have a lot of videos. If you're wondering about anything that I've said, what's the proof behind it? What's the data? I'm trying to not to go beyond what the data forces me to say. Mm -hmm. And I explain all that in the YouTube videos. Great. And we'll put those links on this video. So thank yeah. you so much. All right. Thank you, Dan.